are live on YouTube. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development in Vermont. Um, we are uh, having discussions this morning with uh, some of our um, uh, in, uh, businesses and our some nonprofits, our chambers of commerce, um, to understand what's going on out in the world um, as we start putting together um, the second piece of the relief funds, um, our recommendations to appropriations on how to uh, how to spend that money. So um, I think first, let me pull up my agenda. Okay, so first we have uh, Amy Spear with us. She's the Vice President of Tourism uh, for the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Amy, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Thank you for having me today. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so just if you can just give us a, um, an overview of what, what you see out it's, that's going on out there, especially concerning our tourism and hospitality markets out there, or what's not happening, I guess, it's more more of the the um, the way we might describe it. So. Yeah, absolutely. For the record, uh, my name is Amy Spear. I'm the Vice President of Tourism with the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Vermont Chamber of Commerce represents over 1,200 members, and we are also the state affiliate for the National Restaurant Association and the American Hotel and Lodging Association. Um, with that, we have hundreds of restaurant and lodging members, and we do have uh, continued and, and routine engagement with our membership. Um, and thus, we've, in, we've maintained uh, an informed perspective on what really is impacting them. And really what we see as the two most critical action items for the hospitality industry in this next round of funding is to use a significant portion of the CRF monies held in reserve as a dedicated rescue package for the hospitality industry. Um, <clears throat> and then we're also asking to loosen the eligibility requirements for the economic recovery grant program provided by Act 115 to follow, um, to allow more businesses to be able to be eligible and include businesses that have been left behind in the first round of funding. So that would be sole proprietors, new businesses, um, and then also those that were innovative, pivoted, and didn't quite experience you know, a 50% loss. Some of them might have experienced 49% or 45%. Um, restaurants are a good example where there are some that are hovering around 45% because they pivoted to a takeout business and now you know, they've been left out of the first round of you know, grant funding. Uh, we certainly acknowledge everyone's adjustment to the pandemic, pandemic and providing relief to Vermont businesses. And we're, we are truly appreciative for the steps that the committee has taken. Um, and, you know, we're hoping that you'll um, listen to what we have here today. Um, you know, we do see the proposed 133 million from the CRF fund reserves as a positive um, that the governor proposed, but what I'm going to spend my time today on is certainly on the rescue package and what would be most impactful, uh, particularly for lodging, restaurants, and related businesses such as events and weddings. Um, so in the governor's proposal is a $50 million rescue package for the industry. Um, as I mentioned, we're supportive of this proposal um, and encourage you to consider, for you to consider increasing it um, as you consider the entire package. While Vermont's economy does continue to reopen, the hospitality industry really doesn't see a path to return to thriving, but is instead you know, really fighting to survive. I think you'll hear that today from uh, those that are on the call to also testify. The, pro the proposed additional business relief grants for industries that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID um, are critical as this pandemic economy will continue on for many more months. You know, as you're well aware, these businesses generate tax revenues, create jobs and unlock economic activity in Vermont communities. Um, according to Bureau of Economic Analysis, tourism is 6% of Vermont's GDP, which places Vermont in the top five states whose economies come from tourism. Um, that's from the Pew Charitable Trusts. Um, and the hospitality sector, which includes restaurant, lodging, and industries such as wedding and weddings and events, has suffered disproportionately due to COVID-19. 
Um, and I, I'm sure you've all read this. It's evident in Tom Kavet's report from um, his August 2020 economic review um, and revenue forecast. I just want to pull a quote out of here because it was really, um, you know, stuck out to us as we were reviewing this report. Meals and rooms revenue have experienced um, the most pronounced and lasting impacts from the COVID crisis. Um, restaurants and lodging businesses are the major drivers of the meals and rooms revenue and have been asked to hibernate in an effort to combat the pandemic. Um, these business has, businesses have done everything the government has asked them um, in stellar fashion to ensure the health and health of our people in Vermont. Um, but it has certainly come at a great cost to them. Prioritizing more funding um, that's easier to access is our number one priority going forward. Um, there are, as I mentioned, individual members of the industries that are on the call today. So I'm not going to go into um, heavy details, but I did want to provide a high level outlook um, and the, some information and data behind a restaurant and a lodging outlook, really what we're seeing in the landscape. Um, you know, while restaurants have resumed uh, operations at a limited capacity and have used their entrepreneurial thinking to reimagine their business models, I think we're all well, well aware that the path forward will not be smooth. Um, and based on data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Vermont is the state that suffered the largest restaurant job losses, which is a 71% decrease from February 2020 to April 2020. And this is directly related to COVID-19 operational restrictions. Um, additionally, in a recent survey commissioned by the National Restaurant Association, it's even more evident that consumers are well aware of the economic damage caused by the pandemic um, with 88% of adults responding that restaurants are an important part of their community and many are worried that their favorite restaurant won't survive. You know, I've had conversations in the last couple of weeks with many restaurants and lodging properties in particular. And I've heard a story from a restaurant, for example, that's just wondering, is it worth it for me to even operate? I don't know if I can carry on at 50% because of these operation restrictions. They want to do the best for their business to survive, but also to treat their staff well. And they're, they're, it's really weighing heavily on their mind. Um, and in an industry where their margins are already thin, they're paying for enhanced safety procedures, Many of them are switching to a takeout model, which tends to be the most expensive way to operate a restaurant. Um, they're really just looking for a path forward and this rescue package is, is gonna be critical for them. Um, on the lodging side, you know, I did wanna point out there are three key metrics that you know, the lodging industry uses to determine the health of their industry. It's occupancy, average daily rate and revenue per available room. Um, kind of the gold standard that collects this information is Smith Travel Research. And based on their information nationally, um, occupancy was down 36% year over year in July, 25, down 25%, down 52% year over year for uh, revenue per available room. So, you know, while these might be national numbers and you wonder what does this mean for Vermont, for Vermont it means that given the importance of tourism to Vermont's GDP, our numbers are likely far greater based on industry feedback relating to occupancy and travel restrictions um, that are in place to combat the pandemic. Um, just something that I wanted to speak to anecdotally here is, you know, a, a lodging property that I recently spoke to who has been profitable in the past and, you know, fiscally responsible, has healthy reserves even with all the support that's existed through federal and state programs already is really wondering if they're gonna be surviving past October. They see a bleak future. Um, you know, there are many small inns that rely on summer and fall months and a strong fall um, without that on the horizon. They see bankruptcy in, in their future. And for many small lodging properties, as an example, it's also their homes. So not only are these lodging properties looking at their business, they're looking at where they live being impacted by not having enough um, relief dollars available to them. Um, just something else that I wanted to go into on the bankruptcy and then um, I'll, I'll finish out here is that there's a lot of, you know, many hotel properties and restaurants in particular have heavy fixed costs that don't go away. And this relief package is really going to be critical for them to find a path forward for them to be able to hibernate in order to 
you know, meet the need, the occupancy restrictions to adhere to public health guidelines and do their part to help combat the pandemic. And, you know, we really see and are very strongly supportive of the of the rescue package for the hospitality industry. And um, we do look forward to being a resource as this conversation develops. Muted mine. Questions for Amy? Jim? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Amy, for uh, um, coming here this morning. Um, what, if any, specific recommendations do you have? As you may well be aware, there's a surplus unclaimed. Um, I suggested yesterday. Uh, with specific regard to uh, hotels, motels, and inns uh, that a recalibration of uh, how much money um, they would be eligible for. And I wonder what your thoughts might be on that. And uh, more largely, or broadly, um, what your recommendations are for us. Um, you cut out just a little bit, so I'm going to just summarize to make sure that I am addressing it. You're wondering what our recommendations are to move forward for relief funds for hotel motel and- Yes. Yeah. Um, so we're really advocating for a significant portion of CRF monies to, that are held in reserves to be dedicated to a rescue package for the industry. Um, right now, as these businesses are facing continued operating restrictions to combat the pandemic, um, being able to have relief funds available in the bank, are, it's going to make the difference between survival and closure. Um, so really, you know, increasing the amount of dollars that are available to the impacted industries is going to be the, the biggest impact for, for them to make sure that they, they do see a path to the future. Stephanie? You're muted. Still? Am I okay now? Yes. Okay. Um, so Amy, thank you. The, my question for you is uh, in looking at the distribution of the funds already to this sector, how would you see would you have any recommendations on how the, the fund should be distributed distributed in a different way, or should we maintain the same the same um, methods? Or did you see some? Uh, do you have some perhaps suggestions on, on distribution of these funds? Um, yeah. So looking at how the funds are currently distributed, you know, you're looking at for you know there there was the fifty thousand dollar cap. Now it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollar cap. Um, you know, there are loosening the eligibility requirements that were included in Act 115 would be helpful for businesses um, because then that can address sole proprietors, new businesses, those that were impacted by this. But then there's also um, the 10% uh, revenue replacement cap that's, that's in place. And for some properties, even receiving um, properties, restaurants, or those in the industry, even receiving the maximum amount of $150,000 sometimes really only equates to 3% um, return on what they might've lost due to pandemic restrictions. So um, when you're looking at loss thresholds, that's, that's something there um, for the caps of the award amount that would be helpful because for you know, a small lodging property to a large lodging property, there are a lot of fixed costs um, that are associated with that. And you know, while restaurants might grow uh, linear on a linear scale, you know, increasing the amount of dollars that these businesses can receive would be very helpful um, because for some it might only represent a month's worth of payroll or several weeks versus of payroll depending on the size of the business. Should employees be a uh, number of employees uh, be part of the equation or do you um, I think with the hospitality sector in particular employees are could be a difficult number to have in there for figuring out the relief amount because every business operates differently. So if you're looking at a um, like an inn, for example, you might have an owner operator that's the housekeeper, they're the chef, they're the um, concierge, 
Um, you also, if you're looking at a bakery, for example, you might have a husband and wife team that's that's running that. I'm thinking of one in particular. They don't have any staff. They're just they're in there as a husband and wife operating their business. So when you add in um, employees as a factor for getting relief dollars, it can add some unintended complications for the industry. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, Amy. Uh, it, it's a question I have of scale. Um, you know, we're talking about $50 million. Is that enough money to actually look at the lost revenue and the shortfall um, between revenue and expenses? Because uh, I wonder if the chamber has taken a swing at trying to calculate what the actual cash flow impact is, not just lost revenue, but the bottom line. Um, and to, to identify the scope of the issue, because is, is $50 million even going to make a difference that way? Um, so we haven't done a calculation on that, but I would say any, any level of funding is going to be to a benefit to the industry. Um, you know, I, I think some of the, the hotels and restaurants, for example, that are speaking later could go into really good examples on how cash flow has impacted their businesses. But um, really the more money, you know, if you're making considerations of the funds that are available in the $133 million package, you know, we're advocating as, you know, as much or more money to be put into that $50 million pool that was uh, proposed. Um, because we're really looking at, you know, the losses could be catastrophic for the industry if there's not a rescue package that is substantial and, and could really help them see a path to hibernate and survive. Right. Thank you. I guess, you know, yesterday we were pushing the uh, deputy secretary of ACCD to uh, come up with really some kind of um, easing of the occupancy rate as a way to help the industry really recover. Uh, and that long term, that's really what's going to save a lot of these businesses is being able to operate with people coming from out of state because uh, it's certainly not going to be supported from folks in state. Um, New Hampshire tried something with their grant program, the $400 million Main Street program, but it equaled 17.2% you know, of people's estimated losses, as much as they could estimate what those losses may be. So I, I don't know if it, taking that approach is better or worse, uh, but they now have different occupancy guidelines than we do. Um, so it's really trying to figure out how to move forward that way. So that's why I was thinking about that cash flow loss, uh, should we be basing a formula based on that instead of just lost revenue? And if you're looking at um, you know, the black and white numbers using <clears throat> looking at meals rooms and alcohol taxable receipts, that's a way to um, formulate there. And it, it, it helps to create, particularly within the hospitality industry or restaurants and lodging in particular, you know, it creates a level playing field for what people are paying into because whether it's a sole proprietor or if it's someone that has 50 to 100 plus employees, they're all paying same tax rates and into that system. Um, but yeah, certainly occupancy is uh, continues to be an issue when, um, you know, just because lodging properties could be at 50% right now, for example, doesn't mean that midweek travel is actually 50%. Um, often you see a peak on the weekend when you're looking at Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe they're reaching 50%. I think some of the iconic properties might be stabilized at 50, but you know, you're looking at down to 10 to 15% midweek for a lot of smaller properties. So the weighted average for the industry is likely much less than 50% right now because they're not hitting capacity. And um, generally speaking, from my experience, a lodging property needs to maintain 45 to 50 percent occupancy in order to make any money and not operate in the red. So if we're asking them to operate, you know, essentially operating in the red or barely surviving right now, that's why these additional funds are going to be so, so critical to survival to, you know, help them, you know, get through this, this hibernation and restricted occupancy. Okay, thank you. Christy? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Amy. Uh, always a pleasure to listen to your uh, your comments and stuff. Um, so I, I'm going to take a little different approach, uh, perhaps, and, and maybe asking a lot uh, of you to give an answer. But um, you, you mentioned uh, uh, looming bankruptcies, heavy fixed costs, uh, operating at a loss. 
um, th those are all, uh, I'm sure it's real and I'm sure it's, uh, it's, uh, it's factual. Uh, we have no doubt about that. Um, the legislature, some, some of our critics are saying, if money goes to these businesses that are heavily in debt already and they were filing for bankruptcy, is this just not money going into pockets, for example, um, to, for them to survive and maybe close up shop and go elsewhere type thing or, or not reopen? Th that's the critics. That's not my, my, uh, my opinion. Um, but we're also hearing from the legislatures that uh, uh, some of the focus is, is trying to, how do we stimulate the economy into uh, a, a rebirth, if you will, once the pandemic has subsided and, and, um, and disappeared, hopefully uh, sooner than later. Um, so we, the, 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 amount of, the money is looked at as where can we best uh, put that for stimulating the economy. And I'm wondering if you couldn't speak a little bit about um, your involvement with the restaurants and, uh, and lodging facilities of how this uh, could, would look like, um, uh, what their uh, intentions are that, uh, that you're hearing. And I realize you can't speak for everybody. Um, and, and also uh, there's another economic stimulation uh, package within the, one, the next round that uh, is looking at perhaps say like a gift card for businesses or whatever to be used. But um, I'm still not sure that that would, is the best uh, way to stimulate the economy. But if you, if that's a lot I just said, but if you could speak a little bit about on the ones that are in trouble, uh, the ones that uh, want to stay and, uh, and, and what's going to be necessary to get the economy growing again. And I yeah. realize it's dependent on the pandemic. Obviously. So I'll, um, I'll take a, I'll tackle each one uh, individually. So first, if we're looking at businesses that are in trouble, um, so many, so often if anyone's used, you know, financial advisors in their business, or if they're trying to be fiscally responsible, they have a certain number of days of operating reserves. So let's just say that number is 60 days of operating reserves. So for example, the, the lodging property that I ref referenced earlier, it wasn't that they were in financial trouble before the pandemic, it's because of the pandemic, because they've had occupancy restrictions, there are travel restrictions to the state of Vermont. So it's not necessarily that they were in trouble and they need the money to get them out of trouble for pre-pandemic conditions. It's more of they shut down their businesses. Sometimes you know, they're operating at 50% or less. Um, and they really need these funds to, to bridge them through to a post-pandemic world when they can start accepting um, higher occupancies again, or they can start having more people dining at their um, restaurants. So, you know, that's often the case. You know, we've seen, I've, I've been, um, resiliency is a common word that I've used when I've talk, spoken with a lot of businesses is they have been incredibly resilient and resourceful. They've either, you know, shut down their business temporarily because they knew they had to for cash flow. They changed to takeout models. Um, they've become contactless. You know, these, the hospitality industry, they're the ambassadors for Vermont and they want to see a positive future for the tourism industry. And so while I would argue that, yes, they, they need these funds now to get them through to the other side of the pandemic or to help them get them through the winter or the coming months that we have um, before there's a vaccine or a solution on the other side of the pandemic. Um, so really these, these funds are to help them, not because there's a problem they've created, but because it's a result of the pandemic. Um, I think the tent company, you know, Perry would be a great example where, you might have had every single weekend um, sold out with multiple events in summer of 2020. And because of the pandemic, you know, the weddings, weddings are gone for summer 2020 in reality. Um, but many of them have rebooked for 2021 already. So although the business is lost this summer, they already have the business booked for 2021. So I think that's really why I use the term hibernation is because people have been asked to really hunker down and, and operate at a reduced capacity, a significantly reduced capacity. Um, and the hospitality industry in particular um, has been asked to disproportionately to others to operate at a reduced capacity. Um, if we're looking for those that want to, I guess the, I'll kind of combine the, the next two buckets a little bit, those that want to stay here for the future, 
um, stay in business and be here for the future is everyone's being, I think, resilient, again, is a way to think of it. And they're looking at how to shift their operations in order to, you know, stay afloat. Um, and in order to come through on the other side, you know, the, the it's people come to Vermont because of the iconic experiences, you know, the Vermont brand is made up of all the businesses within our communities. You know, every community has a different flavor. I know I see Eric from the Mad River Valley on, on the call here today. And the experience in the Valley is very different the, than the experience that you would have in the Okemo Valley with Carol on the call. And you know, they're, these businesses create the personality of Vermont and they're really working and trying to find their way through to the other side. And, and without the relief dollars, it's difficult for them to get there. Um, and when we're looking to the future, um, you know, there are two things that have been very apparent from the beginning that have come out in research is, you know, perception of safety and space is going to be critical for people to feel comfortable to return to travel to somewhere. And Vermont certainly meets those two things there. And, you know, while, you know, the first intent to travel to a destination is for someone to book lodging. And while lodging is only able to operate at a 50% capacity, there's, they're not going to be able to fully, you know, return. So when we pick, we have people coming in that are staying at lodging properties, they disperse and they do other activities. They go to restaurants, they do outdoor recreation, you know, they're, they're, um, they're at all the other businesses. So really, if you can stimulate the economy by having people here, you know, that's going to be a high yield for, for Vermont. And we do recognize that now because of the health and safety of, you know, Vermonters and our visitors, there are these restrictions in place. And that's, that is why it's critical for these businesses to get, um, to get relief funding so that they can be here to provide the iconic experiences on the other side, to allow people to travel here when it's, when it's safe. Very good information. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Any other questions for Amy? Okay, um, I just have one. Mm -hmm. oh, Lynn, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say that as a member of the committee, I'm not concerned about whether or not we have to justify this money. Um, I'm more concerned about what I want to hear from everyone is what they think we really need to do. I mean, this is money, some of it that I believe was put aside from the first 400 million that the governor um, uh, talked about when he first set this up like earlier in the summer. I want to know what it is you're going to need and what it is we're going to see going forward because this it's getting it's getting to the end of the year and we want to get this money out while we still can and we want to get it out as quickly as possible and i think um there are some issues that were raised yesterday by charlie that are important the occupancy rate is important uh we are we are hands down safer than anybody else and we are super conscientious about being very conservative about how we reopen and restart but I wanna know what it is all of these vendors and these businesses and these people need so that they can put their people back to work. And so Vermonters can be going, going out and earning a living and not just looking for some kind of $150 to a household. I wanna get something that's really gonna help and make us all safe. Um, and that's what I'd like to hear from everyone. Thank you. Okay. Um Amy, the only thing I didn't hear from you is um, I'd like to know what the chamber feels about the hundred and the fifty million dollars for the um, consumer stimulus that's been proposed by the administration. Um, I think while well, all the programs are a positive um, that have been proposed by the administration because it's getting dollars into Vermont business hands and into um, individuals. Um, but if the committee is really making considerations on which programs to enhance and what would be the most beneficial, um, we certainly think that adding additional dollars to direct um, to the rescue package will help Vermont businesses, which will then be able to continue to employ people, get to the other side of, of the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Anything else for Amy? Amy, thank you very much.
Thank you for your time today. So next, uh, Eric, uh, good morning. Welcome uh, to the committee. Thank you for taking time out to uh, speak with us this morning and um, just kind of fill us in on your experience and what you feel um, we should be looking at to um, help help our businesses. Yeah, well, I'd like to thank you, Representative Markov and the other members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Eric Friedman. I'm the executive director of the Mad River Valley Chamber of Commerce, uh, and we represent about 165 members. And prior to that, I was the marketing director at the Mad River Glen Ski Area for about 20 years. I'm here to share with you how the Mad River Valley's hospitality industry has been act impacted by the COVID crisis so that you fully understand the stress that these businesses are under, and by extension, the stress that our chamber is under. Chambers, generally speaking, uh, are, re are reliant upon member dues, events, and advertising to fund their operations. Um, we are not supported by government entities. Uh, impacts on the chambers across the state have manifested themselves in, in layoffs, furloughs, and reductions in services. The Mad River Valley Chamber is emblematic of that situation. The Mad River Valley Chamber uh, has been forced to let go of one of our two employees. This comes at a time when our members are requiring more of us than ever before. Like, um, like our business community, the Chamber has had to be flexible and has stepped up to support our community. A year and a half ago, I was hired uh, mostly because of my marketing expertise. Uh, but since that pandemic began, I've become much more of a counselor to our local business community. And each and every day I'm communicating with business owners in crisis. They've been incredibly appreciative of the information, guidance and support that we've been able to provide to them. And they found it difficult to stay on top of all the changes, updates and programs that they need to know about. The chamber has become, become an important lifeline to them. It's a lifeline that they, will continue to, that they will continue to need as we emerge from this morass. It's hard to put into words how much has been added to the chamber's uh, bailiwick with the advent of the COVID crisis. Chambers have dutifully taken on extra workload to help our businesses and regions survive, and we hope recover. Meanwhile, our own revenues have suffered every bit as much as our member businesses have. Vermont Chambers of Commerce are not your atypical chambers. We are not the bastions of a faceless multinational corporate business world. In fact, we're grassroots local organizations dedicated to advocating for and representing small local businesses in ways that they could never afford to themselves. We provide critical technical support and assistance to our members every day. Normally organizations like the Metro Valley Chamber are also here to market our region to visitors. Our particular mission at the Metro Valley Chamber is the economic well-being of our, of our local businesses through leading destination marketing, building brand equity, and creating a unified and engaged culture. We create and execute an integrated year-round marketing plan. We're the champions of the Mad River Valley brand. We foster an engaged community culture of aligned goals while we demonstrate and inspire the Mad River Valley's ethos of optimism and enthusiasm. The Mad River Valley the Mad River Valley business community is depending on us now more than ever. While our community has already lost some businesses for good because of this crisis, I prefer to dwell on the positives. I'm so proud of the way that the Mad River Valley's business community has stepped up in so many ways across all sectors. I'd like to take a few moments to share with you two stories that exemplify the Mad River Valley spirit and the vital role played by the Chamber. The Inn at the Round Barn Farm is an iconic institution here in the Valley. Lovingly restored in the 1980s, this gorgeous facility hosts many weddings and events throughout the year. They, along with our local wedding venues, inject millions of dollars into our local economy year in and year out. With the advent of the COVID crisis, the owners, Kim, Jim, and their staff were forced to postpone or cancel nearly their entire event schedule. Their loss of revenue was compounded by the fact that 70% of their annual room nights are associated with the weddings that they host. To make matters worse, they had to return a lot of deposits put down for events, creating serious cash flow issues for them. In the face of all of this, their first priority was to take care of their staff and keep them employed. 
Like so many businesses around the state, they nimbly pivoted their business model in an effort to keep revenues flowing and keep their staff employed. They began using their catering kitchen to offer affordable meals um, to locals and second homeowners. While they did this, they learned that the Mad River Valley community was hurting and that vulnerable people were becoming food insecure. They also realized that their loyal customers wanted to help. For them, this created an aha moment that encouraged them to begin work with other local restaurants, the Mad River Valley Food Shelf and the Mad River Valley Community Fund, as well as the Mad River Chamber of Commerce to develop the MRV Eats initiative. The idea was to pay restaurants to produce food for folks who needed it. This kept restaurant staff employed. It gave residents and second homeowners a vehicle to fulfill their desire to help those in need. Finally, and most importantly, MRV Eats is feeding local people in need. Truly a win-win-win situation. While taking this on, they also worked hard to expand their dining options for takeout. The takeout services provided them the ability to offer picnicking on their amazing grounds, giving locals and visitors an unprecedented chance to enjoy the, re the round barn's beauty that normally wedding guests are the only ones that can take advantage of. It's become a special and popular addition to the summer here in the Valley, truly a silver lining to the COVID cloud. That all being said, no matter how many lobster rolls, lobster boil dinners and fried clam rolls, which by the way are really awesome, that they might sell, it pales in comparison to the wedding revenues, room nights, ancillary spending and state tax receipts that are generated by wed the weddings that they normally host. The Round Barn and our other wedding venues and restaurants need help and they need it now if, we are if they are going to survive and ensure, the long and ensure their long-term survival. The other story I'd like to share with you is how the Mad River Valley Chamber has been working with one incredibly vulnerable sector of our local economy, our lodging establishments. In mid-March, the lodging industry was forced to shut down in the midst of what had been an incredibly strong ski season. The governor called on our hotels, bed and breakfasts and lodges to shut down for the greater good, and they gladly complied. Prior to the pandemic, the Chamber Lodging Group would meet a couple of times a year, share information, and mostly to socialize. Afterwards, we at the Chamber realized that they had a desire to get together far more often, and we created a way to make that happen for them. Ever since, they have met weekly, and they continue to do so. Initially, they wondered how to handle cancellations and how they were going to pay their staff. Then they began to think ahead to the summer and how they should plan for that. All the while, the Chamber worked diligently to provide information and guidance on PPP and idle programs. They continued to meet, to commiserate, and help each other as they encountered various roadblocks. Then the governor started to reopen our economy. The lodges, after being some of the first to close, were one of the last given the, the, the go-ahead to, to get back to business, albeit in a limited way. Their conversations turned to how to open, best practices for cleaning policies, and the like. I can't begin to tell you how many times these businesses and their owners express the gratitude to the chamber for giving them the forum to communicate, support, and learn from one another. Without the chamber structure and our affinity with this sector, the Matter Valley's lodging establishments might not have had the ability to pull together and collaborate. They needed the chamber and they will continue to need it even more as we move forward. The Matter River Valley Chamber and our colleagues around the state need operational funds to make up for losses created by our members, hopefully temporary inability to pay their dues and support our mission. Our hospitality sector is hurting badly. Our lodges <clears throat> were asked to sacrifice from the beginning of the crisis and they continue to be the front line of contact with potential visitors. Whoever would have imagined the specter of lodging establishments needing to follow state-imposed travel guidelines, vetting potential customers based on where they come from, and in many cases, denying them reservations only to see them simply contact unregulated short-term rental providers that don't necessarily follow the rules that they have to. If lodge owners hope to be in business after the crisis fades, they need relief and they need it now. This is an investment in Vermont's future. If the state hopes to see its revenues come back, the establishment needs, establishments need to be there when visitors return. Rooms and meals taxes have always been vital to Vermont's revenues. Now these establishments need your help to make sure that they exist when the crisis is passed. 
restaurant owners that have heroically flexed their business models by <clears throat> offering alfresco dining, takeout, and dramatically altered what they do in an effort to keep their revenues up are facing a winter of uncertainty. Many will have to make a very difficult decision on whether to close up or stay open at limited capacity and hope to break even. If these businesses don't survive, where will future tax revenues come from? These businesses need, to bridge, need the bridge that a rescue package could provide to get them through to the spring. These are unprecedented times and Vermont's local chambers of commerce are expected to lead our communities through the turbulence. Our steady hand and strong leadership will be vital as our economy reemerges. Investing in chambers like ours will reap returns in so many ways. Please help to ensure that we are here to support our local business community. We ask that the state award a one-time $1 million appropriation to the Vermont Association of Chamber Executives, a proposal supported by the state's regional planning and development commissions. These funds would be equitably dispersed to chambers, allowing us to continue to provide the organization, expertise, advocacy, and support of our local business communities that they need during these challenging times. Thank you very much for your time and for your consideration of these vital requests for meaningful financial support. I appreciate it. Questions for Eric? Charlie. Hi, thanks, Eric. Nice to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just want to ask you about the chambers and looking at the, uh, the revenue mix that your chamber or most other chambers have been and aside from membership dues i know a lot of the chambers rely on events to generate income to support their ongoing operations i was wondering if you can comment as to what your uh revenues are in terms of the coming from events versus membership dues uh or in if that's indicative of the rest of the chambers I think each chamber is a little bit different, Charlie. And so thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming and talking to our community a while back. That was really helpful. Um, every, every chamber is different. And I think that's one of the strengths of, uh, of the chambers of commerce within the state of Vermont. Um, we are basically 100% reliant on membership dues. Uh, and we are assuming that we're gonna have a serious loss in revenue uh, from dues this year. And uh, that's what we're budgeting for and trying to make, uh, make that work. Um, you're right, there are some, you know, I know, I believe it's Quichi Chamber of Commerce. They're like hugely um, reliant on their, uh, the Balloon Festival down there. Um, oh, that's your neck of the woods. So, you know, you know about that. Um, and, you know, so they're very different. And I think that there's a mix for other ones. And, um, you know, and, you know, as I said, you know, in my testimony, you know, I think the chambers of commerce have this, you know, reputation of being, um, you know, these, you know, representing big corporate entities and, and we don't here in Vermont. Um, and, you know, we're, we're just representing small businesses in ways that they couldn't represent themselves and, and work collectively. And that's what we need. And again, every, and every chamber is a little bit different. Thank you. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Eric, um, I've got to be quite frank with you. Um, and please don't take this the wrong way. Um, uh, the Chamber is a private organization and you're coming hat in hand uh, to the state of Vermont to help, uh, uh, to help you. And I wonder, you know, the, the frustration that I've felt about the chamber in general is that while you're you're willing to uh, reach out to uh, chamber members, there are many more businesses in your and in, in, throughout the state that aren't chamber members who who still need help. And I wonder if you would be willing to step outside the box of the chamber organization to reach out to those uh, businesses who aren't members. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really glad that you brought that up, Jim, because that is absolutely something that since the advent of the pandemic, um, we have done that. And um, all of the updates and information that I'm providing that normally would just go to uh, our chamber members goes out into our entire business list every time I send them out. Uh, we have our annual meeting coming up 
uh, in, in the first week of September. And I invited absolutely every single business in our community to attend that meeting. Um, we are not differentiating between members and non-members at this point. Well, good on you and shame on me. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Zach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thanks, Eric. Um, I uh, sort of just going off of Jim's comment. I, uh, I I live in an area that doesn't have um, my my constituents don't have. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and uh, and as a result, um, it was pretty much uh, just just me um, working with my businesses, helping them through the PUA. Um, help, I'm, I'm the one that's communicating all these different uh, programs that are available to them and, and simultaneously sort of um, also seem to be fighting against what appeared to be misinformation coming out of the chambers, which was especially frustrating. Um, so I, I, I appreciate that you, are, you all are expanding, but there is, no, there is no chamber to expand into Heartland, Windsor and West Windsor, as far as I know. So how can the chambers um, use this money uh, to reach these communities? Because at this point, with the limited funds that we have, um, giving you all this million dollars that's taking away from businesses in my community, because at this point, it's not going to serve them. You know, fair, fair enough. Um, I would say that you need to differentiate between local chambers of commerce and the Vermont Chamber of Commerce and the US Chamber of Commerce. They're very different animals, okay? And I, I think it's a mistake to lump us all together um, and we all do very different things. You know, we have historically not been a lobbying organization, the Matter of Valley Chamber. Um, I am finding myself, the fact that I'm here testifying for this I, I, is not my wheelhouse. I'm a marketing guy and uh, for me to be here doing this because I know that I'm talking to businesses in crisis every single day. And I'm sure you folks are too. I hope you are because I'm realizing that, um, you know, that, that they, they just need support and wherever that's coming from, whether, whether you have a chamber where you are and if it's, if it's you, that's, you know, that's falling on you. It's unfortunate that they don't have a business organization or a downtown organization to help them. We do, and we've supported, this organization has been supported by our members, uh, and we have been successful for something like 40 years, and we've been able to do that for a really long time. Um, and a lot of non-members benefit from what we do um, because we're attracting people to our community uh, and you know, doing what we do to do that. Um, doesn't differentiate between a member and a non-member. Uh, and the fact that someone comes here uh, and comes to the Valley to stay, they might go down to Granville and go to the bowl mill down there or go to the glass blowing studio go down there or go to Moss Glen Falls or go uh, you know, to Worcester or some crazy you know, you know, little town that, you know, that they just don't necessarily realize that you know, we send them there. Because we, you know, I can't tell you how many times I send people to the Hope Cemetery in Barry because it's cool, yeah. and um, you know, so we're not that myopic, and um, you know, fortunately, your constituency has a representative that's willing to help them, and I think that knowing our representatives here in the Valley, they've done a nice job in helping us out, but they don't have the bandwidth to deal with what I'm dealing with. And if I'm not here helping and our organization's not here helping, I don't know who's gonna help them. And yeah, you know, I, was, I appreciate, you know, I appreciate I, what you're saying. And, and, and by the way, Eric, also, thank you so much for what you guys are doing. What I really, really meant to say was, um, it, we would really like a chamber. I think a chamber would be a beneficial organization in our area. Um, I've seen how beneficial it is in Woodstock. I've seen how beneficial it is in Hartford that these local chambers play an invaluable role for uh, the businesses uh, in the communities they represent. And um, so, uh, you know, uh, to rephrase the question is I hope that we can, I don't know if there's potential, but um, to use some of this funding to help create other chambers in, in underserved areas in Vermont so that 
we can have the same access to these resources. Mm -hmm. Because right now, without the without a chamber, as I mentioned before, this funding is not going to support my community other or other communities in the state that don't currently have chambers that serve them. Yeah, um, and, and if I can add, I mean, one of the things we're talking about a million bucks here in the overall scheme of the, uh, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we're talking about, I think it's a pretty darn good investment. And as you said, you wish you had one. Let's make sure that we're the ones, the, the uh, communities that do have them continue to have them. Thanks, Eric. Thank you all. Yep, thank you. Any other questions for Eric? Hey, Eric, um, did your chamber apply for the, for the grants? For which one, the, the ones currently? Yeah, the ones that ACCD has. Uh, yeah, um, well, I'm not sure. I gotta tell you something, I'm confused by all the different grants. The ones that I'm literally writing a uh, grant request for right now uh, is for the restart grants. Is that what you're talking about? Or the ACCD ones prior the, to that? Well, the, the recovery grants that we put out in June. No, we did not, because we're not eligible. You sure are. There's, uh, I have a list of, of um, uh, a list of chambers that have been funded. Um, there's been about one hundred fifteen thousand dollars that's been given out to one, two, three, four, five, six chambers so far. Nope, we have not. Okay. I, I, so I hope you you do um, yeah, I, do apply you are eligible to apply so we hope you do mm -hmm. anything else for eric mr chairman jim um eric um just to follow up on what mike uh, or, or the chairman said there's been an expansion of uh, the dollar amount so uh, please go to my BTAX and uh, ACCD to apply for that I will. and help as many people as you can. I'm on it. Yes, the chamber would, would apply to ACCD, not to, not to the tax department. Okay, Eric, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so next to Carol. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, committee. Um, Eric, uh, it's not good to have Eric go before me because he, or it was very good because he was so thorough. Um, you know, I'll, I'll try not to be redundant, um, but I think there's some important points that I, I probably want to tease out a little bit. So I'm Carol Lighthall, I'm Executive Director for Mokimo Valley Regional Chamber of Commerce. Um, our chamber covers 12 towns, we have about 350 members. Our focus is tourism, also the service industry. Today I'm here wearing two hats, proudly so the Okemo Valley Chamber, and also the, um, the VASE organization, so the association for 30 chambers statewide, um, representing local, regional, and statewide chambers. VASE uh, mostly is dedicated to professional development, networking, and information sharing between chambers. I'm a VASE member, I'm also a board member, each base chamber is independent, has its own board of directors, um, and we follow local priorities, whatever those are. Chambers, uh, big and small, are funded much the same way, although, as Eric said, um, uh, within varying levels. Uh, so membership dues, events revenue, business advertising. COVID has impacted all businesses across the state. COVID has impacted all chambers across the state. Our member businesses are retail, restaurants, lodging, many mom and pop shops, Main Street businesses, and they're struggling to survive. Chambers are struggling as well. Membership is way down. Events are canceled. Business advertising is limited. Chambers have laid off employees or reduced staff hours. The stories that Eric told 
about Mad River Valley um, is consistent in the Northeast Kingdom, in Brattleboro, in Hartford, in Springfield, in St. Albans, in Bennington. These are all chamber colleagues that took time to send me an email and describe what's going on with them. And there's a lot of consistency across the board. Um, and you know, maybe uh, something else, they're trying to figure out how to keep going. How do we keep going? We know we're needed. All the while, the work we do, our mission to keep our businesses and communities strong has never been more important. Um, so I'm relatively new to chamber world and a big question for a long time is the relevance of a chamber to serve its community. And, you know, and I would tell you, this is a great example of what chambers need to be doing. They, we need to be connected to our businesses. We need to keep the wind um, on their back. Or is that the saying? Um, from the beginning with COVID, we provided information, resources, referrals, technical assistance, problem solving for businesses. I had businesses trying to figure out how to feed their family. And I stopped them in their tracks with that. And I just, I wanted to, them to feel like um, it was safe to talk to me about those kinds of things. That's what we're, that's what we're doing. Um, whatever it takes, we provide a lifeline, we provide hope, we provide encouragement. Um, so far, the access to resources has been, first of all, uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate the resources for our members. Uh, we see the encouragement that they feel. Um, some of the resources just have not worked very well for us. So I'll tell you this, um, the ACCD recovery grant, really wonderful. Some of the stories I've heard uh, from chambers and what we experienced ourselves at Okemo Valley was just the, so chambers have three vital revenue sources, membership, events, and advertising in most cases. And so membership um, in some cases needed to be removed from the calculation for the re recovery grants. And that was based on the format uh, for their tax filing. So in my case, membership was able to, to go through okay. In other cases with chambers, that wasn't the case. Events, so fundraising and events is really how we live. Um, and so that needed to be removed from the calculations. So in some cases, it was either one or two of the main revenue sources needed to be removed. Still appreciative, um, but it's an important fact. The Paycheck Protection Program, I've had my fingers crossed on that for a very long time, thinking we could cover our overhead and our staffing levels um, however, chambers were not considered an eligible applicant, were 501c6s for the most part and not eligible for the federal program. Um, and let's see, um, there, there was another comment I was going to make about that. Um, in general, and I guess I would I would say to Representative Watson for Heartland Windsor and West Windsor, we're in Okemo Valley, we're a regional chamber, we're, our, our heart is big and we want to help whoever needs help. In the same way that um, Eric said, uh, we open the door and we really have opened the door to businesses. We want more people on the bus. Um, you know, long-term, uh, if, if businesses, if we have earned their trust, if we've earned their loyalty um, and membership is appropriate later on, that's great, but that's not our motivation in this case. Our, Regional economies, in my case, are dependent on all of us. You know, we know we'll lose some. We've seen we, we're losing some businesses, um, but we need to keep moving forward and stay optimistic. 
So our request is for a uh, million dollars, as Eric talked about. We're very thankful. The regional development corporations of Vermont, the regional planning commissions of Vermont are our friends, our partners. When we don't know a question, uh, we go to them uh, and, and they help. They're supportive of this request. They want us uh, available and helping. Uh, let's see, just checking my notes. I think in general, and, and um, Eric did a good job of touching on this, but chambers uh, occupy a very interesting niche. And it's a niche that, you know, and I think of it as the, the soul of the economy. Um, when we conduct an event, and right now events are a huge challenge for us, when we conduct an event, it feeds our regional brand, it supports the state brand, we're brand ambassadors. We nurture quality of life in Vermont. We highlight quality of life. So as people, maybe especially now, are seeing Vermont in a very positive, safe kind of way, uh, people are also wanting to come here to live. And that's, that's uh, a, a focus. Um, we've applied for every grant we can apply for. Um, we've made sure as much as we can that the businesses we have contact with are applying. Um, I send a, either a text, an email, I pick up the phone, I call people. Did you see that email? Don't forget the deadline, call me with questions. Um, so it's that kind of thing. The stimulus grant uh, that has a deadline on Monday, it's a very short window. And I'm racking my brains, I'm calling towns, I'm calling partners to just say, um, we need to put something together, something regional that also resonates locally for folks. So that's what we're working on between now and Monday. Uh, thank you for allowing us to provide testimony today. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Questions for Carol? Charlie? Hi, Carol. Um, and thank you for organizing those uh, early spring meetings too among your chamber members uh, to help get out information about what the programs were uh, between and, them. And thank you to Woodstock. Yeah, the, uh, what's, the chamber did a great job. I'm just wondering, uh, you just mentioned the stimulus application. Is that through the Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing for the regional stimulus That's package? Right. Yes. Uh, that's not part of a gift card per se, but different than it's a regional marketing approach. Is that right? It is. Yes, it okay. is. All right. Just wanted to make sure. And, and I was thinking that you probably are working closely with the um, Springfield Economic Development Corporation as well, right? With Bob Flint and his organization, you're working with those guys with businesses or? On the, on the stimulus or just generally? Uh, generally, uh, when you have businesses that are members of yours that you're looking to help or point in the right direction, are you utilizing them as well? Well, yes, uh, for sure. And okay. Bob has um, uh, he's the fastest he has the fastest response time. I send an email, I ask for help, I get the answer, and I just really appreciate it. Um, I say too that it go it's a two way street with us for sure. So if he has something that's important to his organization that he wants coming to our organization shared to businesses, we do it freely and widely. We want uh, businesses to benefit and we don't really care where the information comes from. The RDCs are just important partners. RPCs for different reasons are also important partners. Okay, thank you very much. Thank so you. I wanted just clarification, thanks. Thank you. Lynn? Yeah, thank you. Um, when you talk about events, maybe anybody from the chambers can talk about this, but Carol, you might be a good person since you're representing the association. Um, when you talk about events and you talk about the fact that they have been canceled almost statewide for any number of reasons, um, I suspect the biggest one, of course, was of the fear of large groups of people and we're yes. talking about occupancy rates and re-examining that as maybe as a potential uh, 
help to both our lodging and other, we're, we're getting out of the end of the summer. And um, a lot of these were outdoor events, you know, under tents, food yes. ceremony, food celebrations and whatnot. Um, is this something that you did because the governor put in the state of emergency or is this something that the state told you you had to do or is this something that maybe um, you can re-examine and um, I don't know how much more time you have to look forward to it, but we've got the fall coming, we've got the, uh, you know, the foliage season. Is that something that maybe you can get some permission from or get some way of sort of yeah. doing those on a smaller scale? So just in answer to your question, it was kind of all of the above, just, um, you know, following the governor's uh, guidance on what was safe, keeping crowds relatively small, um, and realizing that uh, a lot of that guidance, guidance was contrary to, to what we typically would be looking for an event. We want something big, splashy, something that unites people and so on. And so it's really rethinking, you know, um, an event, for instance, that tours people around the region, keeps them in their cars. That's a great event. People like that. The big, big you know, we run a magazine. We ran uh, a feature on the best cheeseburger, best burger in the valley kind of thing. Um, I serve on the New England Association of Chambers too, and I'm always uh, have my ears wide open to how we need to do things now. So at the base level, some of what we want to do with this money is to think about what are the COVID best practices? How do we retool? How do we rethink uh, our work plans? And I think we can do that. Anything else for Carol? Carol, I, I, I really like to delve into a little bit about your experience in, in applying for the recovery grant. And yes. uh, I think we need a little better understanding of, um, you talked about uh, some chambers can include their um, losses from membership and others can't. And uh, also events, um, you were not able to, uh, to use your events as a yes. loss. And so I'd like to understand a little better or get your understanding as to why, um, why that is. Yeah, uh, certainly. And so um, we've compared notes a little bit. So I know that it wasn't just a Kima Valley uh, Regional Chamber. So the, the process uh, for the ACCD recovery grant was wonderful. It was just smooth all the way through. Um, maybe the the piece related to uh, we needed to attach uh, last year's uh, Vermont uh, tax return, 990, and so uh, that was and that would include all revenue sources. So in my case, I submitted that, and I was told to review uh, to remove uh, all fundraising. I reviewed the guidelines and the guidelines um, uh, said not-for-profits needed to um, remove fundraising. So I think we weren't, um, the, the instructions weren't clear for that. So that is, so that is, so my understanding it was the same rule for all not-for-profits, not just chambers. Um, the other the other piece uh, with membership. Now our membership uh, dollars were included because it was included in our 990 when it was submitted. Um, another chamber that I talked with, um, and they didn't they weren't using a 990, and they were told they needed to remove their membership. Uh, she ended up getting a check for a thousand eight hundred dollars. And so her chamber, currently she's trying to get her work done for 10 hours a week. 
Um, so those dollars would have been really important. I don't know if that's helpful. Is that helpful? Um, it is. Um, I. Th it really. I'm not sure the ACCD is following the legislature's intent. I, um, we had specifically said that charitable donations, so anything that someone could um, get a tax, uh, a tax yes. on, on their taxes um, was not, we would not count that, but anything else would be counted. So, and it's our understanding from what we learned from our legislative council is that um, any fundraisers that you may do um, raffles, anything like that, um, are not tax deductible. And so they should be counted. So I think we need to have some more discussions with ACCD as to how they're applying um, applying that to everyone. Um, I know I, I did see that the Okemo Chamber received um, $22,683, yes. I believe. Yes, and thank you. Um, but I'm wondering if, um, we'll have to have those discussions, I think, with ACCD and, and better understand that. Um, I think that, um, I think the chambers could be getting more dollars, um, through the grants, which they, in my opinion, should be, um, and, and all nonprofits, so long as, uh, the formula is being looked at correctly following legislative intent. Anything else for Carol? Thank you, Carol. Appreciate your thank time. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sue, you're up. Um, thank you for joining us again. Um, I'm sure, um, I'm hoping things are a little better for you than they were when we last talked to you. Um, but we, um, I think we want to know a little bit more um, and what you see going into the fall and winter time um, um, and see what we, then get your recommendations on what we might do. Great. So welcome. Great. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, it's good to see you all again. Uh, so my name is I'm uh, the owner of Blueberry Barbecue in Burlington, and I'm also one of the co-founders of the Vermont Restaurant Coalition. And uh, we're just a, a volunteer uh, network of uh, restaurants that, that formed early in the COVID period and uh, just been working to gather information, uh, share information with each other and, and help preserve our sector through this. Um, so I think today I'll, I'll speak a little bit broadly from like a, a general restaurant perspective and then maybe share a couple things uh, from my own uh, lived experience here. Um, first, I really want to just recognize thank you for, for that initial round of grant funding. Um, it certainly made a difference to many. And uh, we appreciate the acknowledgement of uh, our industry and, and what we're going through. Um, I think Amy did an excellent job showing hospitality sector impact. Um, you know, the restaurant, the restaurant sectors, we're still in the crisis. Um, even with uh, Vermont maintaining a very high level of safety and um, without the significant COVID impacts that we've seen in other states, with restaurants under capacity restrictions um, and our limited availability to build back revenue, it's kind of like we're, we're still enduring uh, the ongoing crisis at a pretty deep level. Um, broadly, I'm trying to think like what's most helpful to share today. You know, broadly, our businesses are built on capacity. So when that is reduced and restricted, there's not a lot of flexibility. Um, we've, many of us have pivoted to go, to, to go and other models and kind of working to, to bring in as much revenue as we can. But, um, it, 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 it like the math doesn't always work. Um, so Amy brought up the word resilient. You know, I think there's definitely a commitment to resilience and maintaining and seeing the other side of this. But uh, I think what's important for you at all to understand is 
you know, our business levels are restricted, but our fixed costs, our loans, our leases, all of those um, commitments that we made as business owners are maintained. So there isn't a lot of, of change there. <clears throat> um, so it really becomes uh, every restaurant in a unique position. It depends on what your relationship with your landlord was, what your loan relationships are, how big your facility is, how much it costs to fuel. Like it's really hard to give detail on all that because there's so many different components. But I think what I would just share is uh, restricted revenues, um, you know, for the good of the safety of Vermont, um, but revenues are restricted, but many of our costs remain. Um, so you're kind of in this real ongoing bind, uh, which is not uh, the most uh, pleasant experience, but um, what we were able to do this summer is, is pivot to outdoor dining. Uh, that was certainly helpful. Um, it's you know known as like a safe way to, to gather uh, and eat out. Uh, that window is going to close really soon. Uh, we're going to lose outdoor dining here in Vermont. Uh, that's going to kind of map uh, directly with uh, the run out of any restaurant that uses uh, PPP funds. Uh, so we're looking in about eight weeks at a very different scenario here. Um, for Burlington restaurants or my own restaurant, one of the things to note too is generally our summer revenue has helped offset winter losses. So it's just kind of the, the cycle of business and different regions in Vermont are gonna be different, but we're kind of emerging out of summer without that revenue to offset losses. So I think I'm just sharing that just to recognize, like, I think what you're seeing in a restaurant landscape is it's currently intact. People are operating, we're seeing to go, we're seeing outdoor dining, we're seeing a lot of entrepreneurship. Um, we're seeing incredible generous support from Vermonters choosing to take out or eat out. You know, I, I think in the next eight weeks, we just might see a very different landscape going into winter. So I just kind of wanted to, to bring that to your attention. Um, just to talk about the initial grant funding, um, just my own personal experience, uh, it, it really helped create a lifeline to, to, to cover the expenses incurred over that, that initial kind of COVID shutdown period, uh, which for our company was a couple of months. So we were able to use the grant program to pay off our utilities, pay off our lease, pay off all the fixed expenses that we incurred. Um, and uh, it was incredibly helpful. But as time goes on, our it, it's like everything's continued so that that need is gonna kind of continue as long as we're under restriction. Um, I think there's just um, two points that I really wanna just kind of bring to attention on the grant program. Um, my business qualified, we were above the 50% loss threshold, so we were able to access the grant. If you were not able to get in that initial grant and you had losses of 49% or up to, you know, and below or above, like you really missed out, like it was a real hard line, so you were out of the grant program. And I think we might have left a lot of restaurants behind in that with that 50% threshold number. And I understand that we had to pick a number, but I do want to raise some concerns for people that didn't meet that criteria. Um, there's potential that uh, a restaurant was uh, takeout friendly. The initial uh, shutdown started. They pivoted to takeout quick experienced revenue loss, but were entrepreneurial and worked throughout the early COVID period. And it's almost like the 50% threshold may have punished those restaurants that participated. And I just wanna uh, raise a hand there, just looking to acknowledge restaurants that uh, maybe 25 to 50% revenue reduction within that same look back period is something to, to consider as, as far as what we're looking to, to save a sector. Um, because if you did not meet that 50% threshold, you really, you really missed on the initial grant proposal. And 
with our margins being in that five to ten percent, like any revenue loss is really a critical business impact. And um, it's kind of like you can drown in the deep end or the shallow end of the pool. <laughs> like it doesn't, you know. So if you're if you were in, you know, down thirty five percent, it could be as critical as fifty. Um, so just kind of raising the hand for restaurants that didn't meet that initial threshold that got left out of that original grant proposals. I, th I think that there, if there's a way to recognize and acknowledge that, uh, it's really important uh, to preserve the whole sector. Um, the second piece, just to keep in mind, uh, that I just want to bring to the attention of you all is, I think that there's maybe a thought process that we all kind of had that like, uh, a bigger restaurant or like a larger restaurant group would have um, more access to capital or be better prepared to weather the storm. But actually uh, there's some parts of this where uh, big is not better um, because you have uh, higher overhead, higher fixed costs, um, and you're, uh, you're, you're more leveraged. And we just don't see a lot of access to loans, capital, or, or anything right now. Um, so I'm just bringing this up because the way that the cap was established, uh, a $2.5 million restaurant had access to the initial $50,000 grant, the same as uh, under a million restaurants. So that $50,000 could cover four months of fixed expenses for a smaller restaurant and two months for a larger restaurant. Um, I think in the new, in some of the expanded, that, that may be a remedy, but I just want to, it, it, this is not the time you want to be a big restaurant. <laughs> um, and I think if we're looking at this as an economic impact, like preserving our larger restaurants that employ more Vermonters that um, contribute more to the rooms and meals tax, like we want to just be able to note that to, to keep those restaurants intact. Um, so just, if anything, I think it's looking at the distribution. So it's proportional to contribution. Um, that was just something I think, uh, Representative Jerome, that was a question that you had earlier. So um, I think the, in addition to everything that Amy Spears shared, um, my summary is we're a resilient industry. We wanna all be here next year. I think we are, it is unknown what the impact of the restaurant sector is on the Vermont economic ecosystem. Like, I, I think the loss of this sector is not just about rooms and meals tax lines, not about payroll tax, not about unemployment, but there is like a network of vendors and farms and cheesemakers and brewers that we are at the, the hub of. So it's a good place to invest. And I think these grant programs and all the economic aid it really is investment in keeping the sector going while under restriction. Um, the second piece was looking to recognize restaurants with that 50 to 25 percent revenue loss those that missed out on the initial grant funding because i think you can make a case that restaurants that didn't have like the significant revenue loss were operating during the early covid period to serve their communities and it, it doesn't seem right that they would potentially be punished for that and um any revenue loss, 15% below year over year is, is enough to kind of put a restaurant business in crisis. Um, so just looking at that, I think it's important. I think for future grant programs, just looking at the proportional impact that the businesses have on the economic community. Um, this is not a time where it pays to be big. Um, obviously, in my own heart and soul, it's so important that like, the corner deli and uh, the big restaurant on Church Street both make it through. But I just wanted to kind of paint the picture that, that the Church Street restaurant with those with that lease number and that amount of uh, fixed cost is very vulnerable right now, um, just as much as like a, a smaller operator. Um, and I think that that is my uh, story to tell today. Um, maybe I'll just finish by adding like uh, as a coalition, we've been doing everything we can to advocate for 
significant restaurant sector relief at the federal level. Um, Representative Welch uh, uh, co-sponsored the Restaurants Act, which is sector specific uh, federal aid. Um, our Senate delegation has been looking at it and advocating. So we, we know that this sector, the hospitality sector is so vulnerable right now. We know that we need federal monies coming in to support it. And I'm so sorry, but it doesn't seem like anything can happen in Washington DC right now. And I think that there is a, a necessity for Vermont to look at this sector as a critical part of the economy and do everything you can to help keep it intact while we kind of wait and wonder what is happening in DC. Um, but if you look at it from a restrictive mandated part, it's like hospitality and airlines um, as far as businesses that are, that are dramatically affected. Uh, through the crisis. And uh, I'll take any questions and, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, just for, just so you know, it wasn't the legislature that um, instituted the caps, um, but I believe that ACCD now has raised the caps um, so that, and um, I think Everyone that had gotten a, at least a fifty thousand dollar grant can reapply again. Um, so I'm, I think that will be helpful. And of course, we are looking. Um, we'll be looking at the draft legislation this afternoon um, and having discussions on reducing the the um, the fifty percent down to. I think the the recommendation from the from ACCD has been thirty five. So we'll have those discussions as well. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, not so much a question as a comment. I have watched, one, I'm a, I'm a major takeout from Bluebird. I mean, they've got the best barbecue I've ever had. And the takeout is absolutely spectacular. I have watched this business grow and thrive in a tough location. And I just want to underscore that, that they do their job so well and they're struggling. It's so important. It, it, this is not a situation where you've got a business that might have had a problem earlier going into it and COVID hit it. This is a thriving business that is just brilliantly run and with entrepreneurial spirit and great barbecue. And I just one quick question is, do you think you're going to get any bounce from the students coming back? I, well, thanks, Jean. And thanks for being a fan and thanks for your support. Um, Big fan. Oh, cool. I got a little hop in my step today. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know what the UVM impact, we, we, we tend not to have I don't know, UVM Champlain, but we tend not, to, we see that impact on the graduation weekends and on the parent yeah. weekends. We're not as heavily involved in um, the, the, the kind of night, long story short, I'm not sure. Um, Thank you. That's, I, I, I didn't think we would see it. And that's, I sort of wanted to get that on the record to say, yes, we got 10,000 kids coming in, but that does not translate into your business or most businesses. And I think in downtown Winooski is really impacted also with their restaurants. I think that we don't have the data, but I would say what I would think happens is that restaurants and dine-in restaurants are impacted by the college student populations for parent visits, dining out, special right. occasions. And then uh, more of the fast casual deli, fast food have the ongoing support. So it would be different based on uh, style of restaurant. Yeah. Yours is wonderful though. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, we do have five more people in half an hour left, so. Um, Charlie, you're muted. Yeah, just, it's going to be very quick. Um, so I think when you last talked to us, it was, um, there was a concern about PPP loans and whether or not to actually use them. Uh, and then the guidelines changed. The guidelines change in a way so that uh, you're able to use that fund, those funds and be assured that you can have them forgiven. Assured that around forgiveness is probably a, a concern still for many just because 
they, there's still some guidelines, even within the, the, uh, the new wave of, uh, that, that are unknown. Um, um, PPP has been such a difficult loan for this industry because of the initial rollout happened while we were in predominant shutdown period. But the, initially, it was you had to use it by a certain point. So many restaurants, even without being open, rehired their team to take advantage of the PPP loan while they weren't open collecting revenue, ran it out early and were out early when they didn't need it. Got it. Yeah. If you waited and you, it's been like a, like this poker game, you know, if you waited and now you're using it while you're building revenue, there is a, it, you can make a case where it's helpful, but it, so the forgiveness and the um, flexibility act made a big difference for hospitality, but some restaurants used it in that early period because that was what we were told to do. So they didn't have the act. They didn't, they weren't able to take advantage of the flexibility act others have so i think just the rollout and the changes to the program and the inconsistencies of it um still waiting for some final guidelines from the sba on some details like it's just not it's never been like a foundational this is how we're going to use it long uh, i would say it's helped many I would say some never had access to it. And I would say that others used it like they were told their detriment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, know, I know it's a complicated subject. I thought maybe it was a, yeah, maybe. All right, thanks. In 2021, I don't ever want to hear pivot or PPP again. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Sue, thank you very much. Um, appreciate your time and, and uh, all the best to you and, and your association. We'll do our best to see what we can do to help. Thank you. Thank you. Talina, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate the invite, uh, being able to testify in front of all of you on behalf of the Vermont Association of Wedding Professionals. I have to say throughout this pandemic, I have received quite the civics lesson out of necessity. Uh, and I really appreciate all of the hard work that you guys have been doing. I hope you got to enjoy a little bit of the summer uh, during your short break. Uh, it was incredibly, uh, I was, as well as our, our members were incredibly thankful to know after our initial testimony in June that many of our recommendations did find their way into H966 and S350. Thank you so much for that. The vast majority of our, of our members were able to benefit from the recovery grants. The grants were absolutely vital, as you heard uh, Amy and many others mention. Uh, the speed and urgency from both the legislature, the ACCD, and the tax department did not go unnoticed. Uh, I was impressed with the application process. You know, rolling out these programs in the given time frame is no easy task. Sure, there were a couple of hiccups here and there, but it was truly well done. Um, I did get an opportunity to listen in yesterday, and I, you know, you guys mentioned some of the barriers. Many didn't know that they qualified. Um, many didn't understand how much they would get, how it was calculated. Uh, I personally called several of our members, assured them that they qualified, walked them through the process, gave them all of the uh, materials. Uh, we found ourselves on Zoom you know, at eight and nine o'clock at night. I helped them get their books in order. And uh, you know anyone who found it intimidating, I was really there to help them through that process because I knew how much these funds really meant to them. As you heard from the ACCD, the data is in. The tourism, hospitality, and event sectors have been hit the hardest. How hard? Well, <laughs> I own Premier Entertainment, a DJ photo booth and lighting business. Year to date, we're down 77%. This is also the average within our membership of over 200 businesses that rely heavily on wedding, uh, weddings for their revenue. Uh, foliage, my favorite time of year is just weeks away and certainly the most sought after time to wed in Vermont. September is by far our biggest month for revenue. 
for September to December, I'm projecting a loss in revenue of 90%. That'll make a total annual loss for 2020 of 83%. Again, this is very representative of our membership. How did we get here? I think many of you know we were forced to close in mid-March through June until we were able to gather even in small groups. Uh, the average length of engagement for a Vermont wedding is 17.6 months I mean, and wedding invitations go out at least eight weeks prior. So all these events are heavily pre-planned uh, and cannot turn on a dime. So even once we got the go ahead, uh, all of the weddings chose for the most, the majority of weddings chose to either postpone or worse cancel their weddings altogether. Uh, Later, those who held on found the restrictions on gathering size or the mask mandate, something that just didn't fit their vision of their wedding day. So again, we found more rounds of postponements and cancellations. Uh, so now we've been whittled down to just a few remaining celebrations of a smaller size. I do wanna underscore this by saying that we do fully support the governor's commitment to keeping us safe and greatly appreciate his science-based approach. Uh, so how can you help us? We too would like you to approve the money for those who fell through the gaps, specifically within our membership and you heard you know, in the Mad River Valley, uh, new businesses weren't able to access these funds and not just new businesses. Sometimes these were businesses that exchanged hands. So they were just uh, new ownership and there's some uniqueness to those contracts and the way that that, that happened as well that made them ineligible. Um, so they definitely need these funds even more so because they've been waiting longer. Uh, sole proprietors within our sectors of all races and genders Yes, they, they do get PUA, but it's nowhere near a wage replacement. Uh, most of our sole proprietors, this is their full-time job. They are high wage earners who have created their own jobs within rural areas of the state where jobs at these wages, they don't exist. Um, you know, they live in towns like Lincoln and St. Johnsbury and Waterbury and again, very rural areas of the state. And if they didn't have this Vermont wedding industry, they would not be able to reside here. They have young families that they want to have grow up in those communities that they support. But again, they won't, they'll be forced to leave if they're unable to stay here and maintain uh, their level of wages. Their needs are also greater because beyond just salary, with many of the canceled weddings, they have been forced to return retainers and deposits. And yes, we have consulted multiple lawyers, gotten second, third, and fourth opinions across the board. And by and large, that is what is necessary. Uh, it's also very important that you make sure that everyone within these sectors has a chance at both a first and a second grant. So I wanna make sure that there's no restrictions that say anyone who didn't get in the first round, such as a sole proprietor or a new business or anyone like that is not precluded from also tapping into the 50 million or if you're able to increase that uh, bucket for the hospitality sector so that that way they're equal with their peers. Um, our road is definitely a long one given the timing of the pandemic and the event slash travel season. Um, so as, as Ted mentioned to you, the 10% the, the was really designed to cover a couple of months. This, as I mentioned, happened in March of all times, the worst time when the acorns that we saved up to get us through the off season and through the winter are pretty well depleted and we're really looking forward to May and June uh, to get our revenues going again. So we've lost all of our revenue for this year and we don't have any acorns for this winter. So that is presenting a significant challenge. Um, you know, no one and <laughs> no one within the business world would advocate for any business having 12 months worth of reserve just hanging around. <laughs> they tell you to, to use that money and, and make money off of it and, and better leverage yourself. Uh, also, we want to make sure that uh, 
the 48 women-owned businesses that were approved and promised funding are funded first. Um, I believe the number that came out is $325,000 to make sure that they are funded first since they, the 2.5 was exhausted in the event that following September 1st, they don't have access to those funds. Um, and then if at all possible, uh, lift the quarantine requirements. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen, but within the last week, the CDC has changed their guidelines regarding those. Uh, this can be done prior to the upcoming foliage season in conjunction with occupancy restrictions to assist our lodging members to accept more guests. Uh, that won't necessarily help all of us. As I mentioned, the lead time for planning a wedding is significant. So for most of us, that ship has sailed, but certainly those that are able to accept new reservations and people can make these decisions and say, let's go up to Vermont next week. Um, they can capture some of that revenue. Uh, also, it will allow them possibly to create some acorns so that once all of the CARES funding money uh, is gone by the end of December, they have something in January, February, and March to get continue to get them through until that travel and wedding season is back. Certainly a large part of why you guys should be supporting the Vermont wedding industry is because we're going to be a big part of bringing this economy back. The Vermont wedding industry contributes $415 million of economic activity annually to the state. Uh, you know, Joan may not have a crystal ball, as she mentioned, uh, but when it comes to the wedding industry, we kind of do. Uh, we have since everyone has postponed an incredible amount of business and people who have said we promise to come back next year, but we have to make sure that we're ready for that. Um, the money that people spend on a wedding is spent in Vermont. It's spent with local vendors. It's not spent with big businesses. Um, and again, by and large, our members, this is their full-time job. They're using it as their main source of income to support their families. It's not part-time work that is just extra cash to spend. Um, and also when couples choose to marry in the state of Vermont, they bring 100 to 200 of their friends and family with them and expose them to the state of Vermont, which is a really big deal. 46% um, of the couples that get married in Vermont do not reside here. And just shy of 425,000 guests attended weddings in the state of Vermont last year. A tremendous number of people. Uh, we need to maintain that Vermont brand. And like I said, the only way to do that is through exposure and experience. So these people are coming and they're saying, wow, I went to my friend's wedding, you know, they're from Colorado, they're from California, whatever it is, because they went to college with whoever got married here. They never would have chosen to come to the state of Vermont until they got that wedding invitation. So now they've come here, they've experienced what it's like to be in the Mad River Valley, to be in Stowe, to be in Woodstock. And the next time they plan a vacation or a ski trip or something like that, they remember what it was like in Vermont and they come back. Um, also, I know there was a little bit of a concern about uh, the calculator and uh, especially with many in the hospitality sector maxing out uh, and whether or not they would see a duplication of benefits. I did play with the calculator uh, yesterday and between uh, and, you know, along with some examples from our membership, even people who received these grants, people who receive PPP money, um, and it, it says in there uh, whether or not you, um, I'll read it to you, it says risk of experiencing a duplication of benefits from your prior grant, no risk, your current losses are, e are greater than the grants you received, additional grant money your business could apply for, $0. Risk of experiencing a duplication of benefits if you receive additional grant funds. No risk. Uh, that's those are the answers that our members, by and large, will get. 
they desperately need this money. As I said, we're looking at annual losses, not just losses over the months of March, April, and May. Um, these are continued sustained losses for the entire year. Um, what's so next? Talina, if, if I could, we, we're down to 15 minutes. Sure. And I have um, three and four more people that need to testify. Yep. Um, I really appreciate um, what you've told us. It gives us um, a good focus on, on looking at making sure that we can get more dollars in. Just want to make sure that, that you and your members know that they are able to reapply right now for more grant dollars. And oh, I they do know that. that. Every single one of them knows that. <laughs> that's that's uh, good. If, and I hope that uh, I hope they do that um, to help continue them to sustain um, while we go through all of this. Yeah. So the, the the number one big ask is that that ten percent goes to to being able to get an additional ten percent in that I, uh, hospitality second round of grants. And I don't believe that ten percent is anything that we put in. Um, I think that's something that ACCD is, has um, put in part of their criteria. So um, I'm hoping that they've heard, heard you all loud and clear of your needs. I'll be speaking with Joan this afternoon, so <laughs> I, they will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, next, Courtney. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Thank uh, you. I appreciate the time here. Uh, my name is Courtney Lowe. I am the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development for the Woodstock Inn and Resort in Woodstock, Vermont. Um, I'm gonna echo a lot of what Amy, Sue, and Talina have talked about, um, but uh, I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a tough road, but we appreciate everything this committee and the uh, legislation that what has done for, for business, businesses thus far. Um, but as we know, we acknowledge that it's a, uh, a difficult choice to be made. There's a lot of people suffering and there's no easy answers. But um, just so you know, I'm also representing the Vermont Lodging Coalition, newly formed. I think many of you may know that we had a Vermont Restaurant and Lodging Association that uh, um, went away in 2005. The Chamber of Commerce, Vermont Chamber of Commerce took it over. Um, and of course it took this event to, for us to get our act together and get back together. So um, you'll be hearing a lot more from us in the future, but I'm representing dozens of uh, hotels and a growing number of membership right now. Um, you know, the big thing is it's definitely a dire situation for so many iconic uh, Vermont businesses um, that definitely define the state and the hospitality industry uh, is one of those. Um, you know, so many brand names, independent brand names uh, in our state uh, in the lodging industry that that really help us uh, put Vermont on the map. Um, and we bring hundreds of thousands of tourists in this state each mm -hmm. year. Um, and, you know, the expectation of those those visitors of the Vermont brand um, is a very uh, wholesome, <laughs> uh, very accepting uh, hospitable atmosphere for them to visit. So my worry in the long run is that the Vermont brand uh, is right now is kind of shut down. Um, and I worry about that, but I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, you know, the, from the Woodstock Inn and Resorts uh, viewpoint, we, we closed March 16th and uh, we reopened uh, July 1st. Um, you know, 50% occupancy for us, uh, we can get there relatively easily. Um, our demand was so great before this. So many people wanted to travel here. Um, one thing you got to realize is that the pent up demand of drive, uh, of, of the drive market is so huge because nobody's flying anywhere. So in the, in the area of the country that has the least amount of cases, uh, those people want to travel within that area. So that's important to think about. Um, our property, like many others, uh, um, since 2009 and, uh, Hurricane Irene coming through, uh, we had to rebuild tremendously. This, uh, we had to rebuild twice. We started in 2009, then we had to start over again in 2011. And the big thing for us is about building cash and, and all these and putting some cash 
there so we can survive in the long run. And unfortunately, this event, you know, took uh, took it all away in a blink of an eye. It's almost like our, our savings account was hacked and everything was gone. So, and uh, larger properties like myself and some of those iconic properties I talk about, uh, like, a, like the Woodstock Inn Resort and others out there, um, we actually don't qualify for any relief, um, just so you're aware of that. Um, so we've got to take on many other means to survive in the long run. And I believe it's said a couple times today, it's, it's about getting to next June, if everything is okay by then, getting to next June normally through most years, getting through the winter and spring is difficult for any of these properties, even, even if we're having a good year. So um, that's tough. So that support is, is incredible. I am worried about some of these uh, properties that we know from small, small ends to larger places uh, that are family owned, that uh, we may never see them owned by families again. We may see them owned by private equity groups in the long run. We may see other brands in certain areas, uh, major national brands that you may not want here in Vermont, who knows? Um, so those are concerns. Um, as you know, we provide tons of jobs right now. I think the job markets, it, it's interesting. The job market was difficult before this. It's difficult coming back in, uh, even uh, when restrictions get lifted more. Um, it's it's uh, gonna be a tough job getting people back to work. Um, so uh, many, as I said, many of our businesses would be operating at near capacity. What's interesting what I found out is mostly central and southern Vermont can hit that number a lot more than some of the northern uh, part of the uh, uh, state. And I think a lot of that has to do with the Canadian border. Um, and then some places it considers uncertain times. Like if you're a more rural area like uh, Woodstock is, uh, people are more willing to come there and spread out. Um, but uh, one thing you got to understand is that the hospitality industry has always been uh, in the, the cleaning and safety business. And, and, and in this event, we've been doing better than, than anybody. And it's, it's amazing. So um, although I would love to have my wedding business and the conference business back right away, I think we're all completely understanding that that is really the one of the main issues right now in the short term that uh, can affect us uh, with, with new cases. Leisure travel was very interesting, and I know Charlie's brought this up, um, and Representative Dickinson, thank you for bringing it up as well. Uh, leisure travel is uh, a very safeguarded um, uh, business right now, and if, and if you, I, I know this group doesn't make that decision, so I'm having an opportunity to get in front of the health department this week, but um, if you are talking to people, just realize if you look around our neighboring states that leisure travel has not had any effect on anything. Um, and, and I say that, uh, and if it has, it's very little, but in some cases like Cape Cod, cases have gone down and visitation's gone up. The, the graph kind of looks like this. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So when you look at it, people come here for two days and then they go home. Um, they literally don't stand in front of people for 15 minutes. They're, they're out doing their own thing. They're out hiking, they're riding bikes, they're not and because of restrictions on bars, and we're okay with that too, because um, we can still do spread out cocktail service and bars are another place where people meet people that they don't know and they get together. So if you really do the uh, homework on the science on leisure travel alone, um, you'll see two things. One is it can help out our economy and it's an easy way out for us. Uh, it's not having, it's, it's less dollars having to be found to help save us if we can get at least save the fall uh, time period. Um, and uh, it is, um, you know, it's easy, much easier for us to manage. So we don't see groups of people getting together and, and doing that. And I think uh, that's something we have to seriously think about. Um, so um, I am concerned about the Vermont brand being closed. I think we've got a long road ahead. So those marketing dollars that are upcoming, um, the timing of the use of those marketing dollars has to be, is crucial. Um, however, I am one not to rest on our laurels. Um, at the Woodstock Inn Resort, we're spending dollars that we don't have to keep our brand out there and make sure that for our future, when we do open more, whenever that is, that we're ready to go and people are, are, know that we're here. Um, and I have colleagues in both New York State and Massachusetts and Cape Cod that are thanking us for 
um, being at 50% because they're benefiting from it uh, right now. Um, so the, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the lodging, um, the lodging industry is highly capitalized. Their fixed costs are tremendous. So uh, right now uh, with the lodging restrictions, I mean, we're bleeding. It's just, it's just mitigating a little bit of the bleeding, but we are, uh, we're hurting. And you got to understand we are very low margin business to begin with. So um, if I were to share with you what we have to make in revenues and what we bring home at the end of the day, it's unbelievable. I mean, it took us years to climb to a positive uh, number. And again, I said we built that pot probably over the last five years. And again, it's gone. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I really think going back to that leisure trial, we're really missing an opportunity, a very low risk uh uh, um, opportunity um, I've seen in neighboring states. Um, the proposal for the dollars, a property like mine, um, you gotta you gotta go really high to get a number that even makes sense. You know, fifty thousand dollars, even one hundred and fifty thousand is a drop in the bucket, uh, and even fifty thousand dollars for a lot of these restaurants and lodging places are only going to get them by for a few months, and that's it. So I'm concerned about the long term and what we're going to be able to do. Uh, there. So um, the disproportionate um, disproportionate uh, funding um, has already been mentioned. I was going to give an example of that, but um, I think that was already spelled out. So you understand that. And I know um, it's at least something that hopefully the ACCD can, can uh, take a closer look at those parameters. Um, I did want to mention something about the gift card program. I think that's a lot of money going into something I'm not, most of uh, the lodging coalition does not really understand how it's going to work. And we know, we feel very much that we're not going to benefit from it. Um, we'd have to develop uh, great campaigns to try to draw people in uh, to utilize it with, with our industry. So we would prefer that that money be shifted to the lodging industry. Um, and utilize that for, for more aid. Um, we think that direct hit into to our uh, targeted at our industry would be very helpful for the hardest hit industry uh, in the state and the entire, entire world. Um, so um, something to think about, because I think a lot of those funds will certainly be used in good ways for some people that really need them, especially to get maybe groceries on the table um, and pay mortgages and so forth. Um, if that's the way they can use them. I don't, I don't actually, I don't, I don't know all the eligibility of that, but I do know like grocery stores seem to be doing very well right now um, and things like that. So I think we really have to take a look at what targeted industries should benefit from this gift card program if we continue with it. So something to take a harder look at. Um, and that's about it. Um, you know, I appreciate, I know all of this is really hard and you guys have heard monster numbers. I think when our coalition realized all the way up until about June, we're gonna lose, it's a, the multiplier number of what, how we affect, um, affect tourism. It's about $1.2 billion of revenue that's gonna be lost. And lodging alone is about $560 million. Um, so they're astronomical. If you can imagine when we first started doing this, I had a committee of, eight of us talking together. Between the eight of us, we had $70 million of loss through uh, December. That's crazy. So um, it's a long way to go for all of us. I appreciate your time today. Um, and I hope uh, you can continue to do more for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, one thing um, I believe you were talking about um, your business that you couldn't access the grants. And I'm assuming that has to do with the um, revenue cap that they put on. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. But if we will and, and one thing to consider too on a larger property side um, is uh, the fact that let's take Woodstock and resort as an example. We sit in one village and we are pretty much the main business in this town and the other lodging facilities fill in very nicely with all of that but we pretty much support a, a large bit of what we do supports this town in this immediate area tremendously and and it affects everybody here 
Yeah. No doubt. Um, maybe someday you you can meet your state rep, Charlie Kimball, and yeah. he can help. <laughs> I, do. I would like to say that Charlie's been extremely helpful in providing us all the information and communicating for us, and uh, he's done a wonderful job thus far. I'm sure he has. Thank you very much. Adam? I'll pay you later, Courtney. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for having me here today, committee members. Uh, I had some prepared comments, um, but really want to be mindful of, of your time and how best to use this opportunity. Um, so I think I'll just uh, start with a, a couple of brief comments uh, in support of the governor's proposal uh, for the continued use of the CARES funds, um, as well as supporting uh, the VASE request. The, uh, the RDCs, um, of which I'm the former president, I, just to clarify, I'm no longer uh, the, the president of the RDCs. Uh, and for the record, my name is Adam Grinold, Executive Director of the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation. Um, RDCs have been having conversations across the state with chambers. Uh, you know, we strongly support their mission and their, their purpose. Uh, and what we see is just an inability uh, due to everything that you've heard today from events uh, to membership dues uh, to sustain their operations. It, it, is, it is an extinction event um, for these organizations. And they are so critical to the, the small business network that keeps Vermont what it is. Um, and we really are supportive of finding some way to ensure that they can get through to the other side. Um, Many of them have brick and mortar expenses. Uh, many of them have already uh, uh, reduced their expenses through now almost volunteer staffing um, and are really just trying to, to get through. So um, the RDCs are happy to support that request that's been made. Um, I think we heard about some of the challenges that the chambers faced in applying uh, to the funding in regards to donations or charitable uh, or, or uh, fundraising events. Um, so maybe if that's clarified, that's another path forward, um, but we, we support that request. Um, I think many of the, the programs that have been laid out and discussed already today uh, in the governor's proposal for the use of these funds, the RDCs uh, are behind that. Uh, we see the, the economy uh, having received, the Vermont economy having received uh, almost $3 billion dollars. Um, from outside sources recently that, that's been sloshing around. And that's really masked what's going to happen. Um, you know, when those dollars came into the economy, they moved throughout the economy and we're, we're still seeing them move through. So it's a billion dollars uh, in PPP, the, the CARES money, the UI, all of that money is, is really keeping our economy moving right now. So as bad as this is, personally, I think is it's as good as it's going to be for a year or, or more. Um, because what we did is in the hospitality industry, COVID hit right when the hospitality industry and all of its employees were already preparing to hibernate. They know that seasonal ebb and flow. Uh, so they, they anticipated that, they were ready for that. Um, employees actually ended up receiving additional income, un unanticipated income that they were able to put out into the economy that otherwise would not have happened. Uh, as, as restaurants reopen, um, they had some, some support both from the state and the, and the federal government to help those operations. As those go away in winter hits, we're, we're facing this looming cloud of being forced back inside um, while still having diminishing outside resources. The, the way we describe an economy to people who don't necessarily understand the economics is uh, as a swimming pool. Um, if you picture a swimming pool in the summer, kids getting in and out, they bring the water out with them, the water is evaporating. Uh, eventually the water disappears. There's no, you can't swim in that pool anymore unless you bring water from outside sources back into that pool or into that economy. Um, if we're not able to generate enough revenue, our pool will run dry and we won't be able to share that those dollars or that water uh, within the within the state. Um, really briefly, what we've seen uh, reported by FEMA 
uh, recently is a couple of uh, declining indicators in the, in the New England manufacturing. So we see layoffs happening um, in manufacturing. 50% of manufacturers have laid folks off. A um, couple other data points, 60% uh, are restricting funding um, and 90% have experienced a de decrease in sales. So it's, it's not just tourism, it's manufacturing. Uh, we see just this week, uh, consumer confidence nationally is on the decline. Um, so we do have concerns about the coming winter. Um, want to thank you for everything you've done uh, for Vermont business, for Vermont industry, um, in providing uh, access to these funds to date. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today and happy to answer questions. Thank you, Adam. Charlie? Thanks, Adam. And I know we're short on time, but Adam, you have the uh, enviable position of also knowing exactly what's going on with the CDBG grants for the uh, sole proprietor stabilization fund, because you guys are administering that. So yes. we heard a little bit yesterday about um, the fact that the lottery was not terribly oversubscribed, that you had, I think, 300 businesses that you were funding, I think, something like that. Um, can you speak to how much money you have left or when people will know what they got and then you've got another chunk of money coming, right? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yes. So the CDBG CV was for the sole proprietor uh, program and uh, statewide, uh, we were able to distribute uh, 1.4 million, um, which left uh, about $100,000 left to roll forward to the next year. Um, the reason it wasn't fully subscribed is uh, there was some challenges with people receiving some other uh, program funds through CARES, uh, so the duplication of benefits. So they had come in, they'd sort of taken a spot in that lottery application, and it wasn't discovered until too late that there was a duplication. So fortunately, the rules are changing. So next round, the funds will be available and they will find a, a path either directly through ACCD's sole proprietor program or the CDBG CV round two program that we'll be administering and kicking off in early September. Okay. And, and how much money is gonna be available in that second round? Uh, um, I'm not entirely sure if that's been finalized, but I think it's gonna be about another 1.5 million. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. So Stephanie? Just two quick, quick, quick questions. Um, Adam, was the lottery a success? Was that a good way to um, administer that program? Uh, well, it was a success in that uh, the applicants were, were fully funded. Um, so real quickly, you know, I can just read through these. Uh, there was um, about 25 who received uh, grants of $5,000. Uh, there was about 16 who received $7,500, uh, and there was about 110 who received $10,000 grants. So those are sole proprietors, small businesses uh, who all went to bed with a big relief last Friday. And my, my next question is this combination of the RDCs and the chamber. And I noticed that in Rutland, the chamber, the Rutland Regional Chamber of Commerce has merged with the Rutland um, Development Corporation. So is this a sign of the time? Is there redundancy between these two organizations? And will do you see more of them folding together? Or do you think it's just a, a one-off and a unique position within Rutland County? Yeah, um, we've been having a lot of conversations to that effect. I'm a former uh, chamber executive, so I know that world well. Um, I think uh, like all industries, um, everyone has got to look at their model um, and, and consider it. Uh, so I think there will be some more regionalization of those efforts. Um, importantly though, chambers reflect a very local community, a local effort. So if there's ways in which uh, the, the division of roles and responsibilities could be shifted um, so that some of those local efforts were more focused on the needs of the, of the smaller businesses within that community, and allowing some of the other perhaps marketing or um, industry representation efforts to be more regional in nature, uh, there may be a, a stronger sustainable model for all of those entities. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Lynn? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm building on what Stephanie just talked about. Um, the chambers take care of the local small businesses and the RDCs take care of the larger businesses. You just mentioned manufacturing. Uh, just in 25 words or less, how are your more traditional clients doing in this situation? I mean, other than manufacturing and other larger groups in, in the industrial parks and other places that you're working with? Yeah, I think it's really hit or miss. Uh, you know, some businesses are, are thriving, um, still seeking additional employees. Um, and then other sectors are, are challenged. So uh, take a, a small um, food manufacturer. Perhaps they used to sell bulk items to grocery stores. No longer can they sell bulk. Now everything must be bagged. So they need to find a new uh, process. They need to find a new way to sell that. So those entities that are able to do that more quickly have been able to find new avenues. Um, and some just need some more help to do that, some technical assistance to get to that point. Do they get any of this money that we've been talking about? Uh, oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, it depends on their sector and how they would apply. Um, and then, you know, coming up, there will be some technical assistance programs that the ACCD is administering um, that they'll be able to apply to as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Adam, thank you for taking time to spend with us this morning. I appreciate everything you're doing. Yeah, thank you. So uh, last is Perry Armstrong. Perry, welcome back again. Um, thank you for taking time to talk to us. We're a little bit in overtime now, but um, we can still spend uh, spend some time with you this morning. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks everybody for inviting me back. Um, my name for the record is Perry Armstrong. And I represent the Vermont Event Rental Companies of Vermont, and I'm president of Rain or Shine Tent here in Randolph, Vermont. Um, so just to kind of give you a little overview of where we're at. Um, most all of the event rental companies, which there's about nine of us, have experienced a 70 to 90% loss of revenue since March. We don't expect that's going to change much. Um, we have been picking up a little bit of work. Uh, early, we were looking at uh, doing stuff for restaurants, but obviously some of those restaurants weren't able to afford our services. And so they didn't have the cash themselves and the grants weren't available at the time. So a lot of them kind of rebooted and did different things. Um, here locally, I provided four tents to the local restaurants at no charge to help them along. Um, other things that have recently happened is we're getting a barrage of requests from school systems right now looking for outdoor classrooms. The problem with this is there's not enough inventory in the state to cover all this. So I've actually gone out, bought some inventory that I think I can cover, you know, and, and we're not gonna make a lot of money on it, but we are supplying a, a need, or covering a need that seems to be out there. So over the next week or two, we're gonna be uh, installing those through the college systems that we've worked with and some of the high schools and, and some of the smaller elementary schools. So all of us are doing that. Um, we, uh, we desperately need some assistance here. Most of us, um, you know, we're thankful for the, the, the grant we got. And I believe we're hoping that we're, our INCS code allows us to access some more here. Um, we know we were kind of lumped into retail, but I believe we fall under hospitality. So <clears throat> I'm hoping that we can pick up some, some additional funding here because we know that this was for two months, but that money's pretty much exhausted. Um, I'm, I personally, you know, ran out of PPP in June. I laid off all my employees. Um, we've been unsuccessful at the present moment to try to find any way to um, hibernate our debt. Um, I have been working with Community National Bank and have been reached out. I reached out to Kevin Morehouse at SBA, and a number of us are trying or attempting to get into the SBA 7A loan program before the 27th of September's deadline. So that um, is, is a vehicle that we believe will help us. Um, but as you can imagine, it's going to, it requires a lot of extra paperwork. Um, the RDCs have been extremely helpful here. Uh, Bob Haynes at Green Mountain Economic Development, you know, got us connected with Ross Hart, who runs Vermont's, uh, my branch of the SBDC. And so he worked with us over a week long period of time to generate cash flow statements, helping us to look forward. 
And we were pretty sure we were able to do that, but we greatly appreciate his assistance. And so with that, um, three of the other tent companies at the present time are going down that same path. Uh, in order for us to survive, we really need to figure out how to park this debt. You know, that was the conversation we had back in the spring when we were talking to you. And right now, we, we're not feeling like we've got some answers here because the problem is I had actually applied to a different bank and we were turned down because they won't take on the risk. They just feel even with the federal, um, even with the SBA support, you know, buying 75% of the loan back, they're not interested in the other 25%. So we're struggling right there. Um, <clears throat> I did get a small grant slash loan from Green Mountain Economic Development to knock off some, some uh, pieces of equipment that we had um, payments on so that relieved my monthly payment burden by about 1500 bucks a month, but we're still needing 17, 18,000 a month to get through. Um, I do know, and I'm concerned about the lodging slash restaurant venues. And I understand that, you know, there's a big need here in hospitality, but I will share you that I really believe, and I listened to this yesterday, um, your, your session yesterday, and there's a very fragile ecosystem here of what really goes into this Vermont um, events industry. You know, so, you know, the sole proprietors are part of that. The, the lodging venues are part of that. You know, you guys talked yesterday. I think Jim discussed a gentleman farmer who, who is, uh, supplies food to that, to that network. And so that ecosystem here is truly responsible for a lot of tax dollars that come back to you folks. And I really hope that, you know, you'll find your way here to boost this program to get us through to the spring. Um, so that's kind of what I've got right now. If you guys have any questions, I can, uh, can answer those for you. I think in a nutshell, that's kind of it. So I'm trying not to burn up too much of your time here. Any questions for Perry? Jim? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Perry, um, in uh, the governor's uh, uh, release of uh, our extension of funds uh, that I'm looking at, uh, it's the uh, Economic Recovery Grant Program. Did you apply for that? Yes, I did. Um, the, the challenge here is the cap. And I think you've heard that. I mean, a lot of what you already heard is very similar to our situation. We applied for it. We received the $50,000. Mm -hmm. um, we've now reapplied for this round two that Joan mentioned yesterday. Um, right. I think we're going to, you know, I, I believe we're going to be eligible for some of that. Um, mm -hmm. And so if we do pick that up, you know, that's going to be helpful in addition, but it's not going to get us through to next May. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that, uh, you know, just speaking out loud that we can expand it um, because there's, there's a very evident surplus that Joan talked about yesterday. Um, and um, I hope we as a committee can uh, do whatever, whatever we can to uh, expand that. And uh, I thank you for your testimony and wish you luck. Oh, thank you. I do want to mention a couple other things. I just forgot. So one of them, and I'm not sure if you all are aware of how New Hampshire rolled out their aid program, but it was very transparent. Um, they actually surveyed their business members and they got a, an idea of what they needed. They allocated $400 million to that Main Street Relief Program of which currently I believe they've expended 350 million dollars plus or minus a little and they've serviced i think they've provided grant relief to 5300 plus businesses i'll share you what, what happened that's some of that money some of that money that they rolled out early went to the you know restaurants who actually purchased tents from our vendors and we actually got the call to go put them up because they really weren't interested in renting but they had the revenue at that point to boost their outdoor dining space and i can tell you right now i've been in contact with those restaurants and some of them are having record setting years because they were able to provide space for their uh, clients. So that was extremely helpful to those folks. And I do know that one business that I'm very much in communication with most of the time over there, a similar business to ours, uh, you know, they received a $240,000 grant. And this guy tells me he's good till next spring. He doesn't need anything else. He had six months of deferral payments. He's back to pay, paying his payments at his bank. And, you know, he's feeling pretty healthy. I don't think any of us on this side of the river can say that. 
Zach. Hey, Perry, thanks for coming in um, and appreciate that you <clears throat> are, were, um, you know, donated tents to businesses so they could set up shop outside. I, I was curious if there was, um, if there was actually any opportunities for you to recuperate some of those, uh, um, those costs in terms of, you know, it was a donation that could potentially be considered uh, COVID expense, uh, COVID related expenses. Um, I was curious if there are opportunities to recuperate those sort of goodwill efforts, um, or if that would be something that you think that we should look at, because I, I can't imagine you're the only business that that went out of your way at your own expense to help out others. Um, that is true. I think a number of the businesses um, like mine did what they could do for their communities. Um, to the best of our knowledge right now, um, there's nothing that we're aware about that would compensate us for that. Um, I think that you know, if there was some money rolled out to the downtown programs, which was discussed early on, that would have been beneficial. And truthfully, you know, right now, those tents I have sitting out there, you know, those four tents, technically they could be generating revenue for me going forward because I'm short to give to the schools. So I'm okay with it. You know, trust me, it's helped out the community here a lot. You know, a lot of people have been, you know, under the tents, they've used the tents for some events in the community, you know, just to kind of get people back engaged. So. Thank you very much uh, for your compliments on that. Thank you, Perry. Anything else? Perry, thank you for taking time uh, to come speak with us today. And uh, we, uh, we hope all, all sugars off well for you and, and for the industry. And uh, we're hoping to do everything we can um, that's in our power to help. Thank you. Thank you guys for your time. And I really appreciate your efforts. So I think uh, we're, we're in a little bit of overtime, but not bad. Um, appreciate the committee's indulgence and, and uh, willing to stay on a little longer. Um, and I want to thank everyone that joined us today to that testified. Um, we appreciate you taking your time to be with us and, and, um, fill us in on what you see going out, going on out in the, out in the field that we may not see. Um, we will do, like I said, do our best to, um, and do everything in our power to, um, make sure that we, um, we can, um, help you, um, going forward. And let's just hope that, um, we can open up the state a little bit more um, so that we can bring some more business in that would, I think ultimately that's what's going to save everybody. So thank you committee. Um,